Uh, welcome back to Leagues. Uh, today we have a really exciting joint session with the Michigan Scrubs uh, group, uh, which is the surgery uh, interest group for medical students here at Michigan. Uh, today, we are so excited to welcome Dr. Andrew Ibrahim, um, who is there in the right top of the corner. I mean, this is kind of where it looks. Hi, Andrew. Um, hey, call him Andrew. Dr. Ibrahim, uh, MD, Masters, Assistant Professor of Surg Surgery and architecture, arch architecture, if you knew that that could be possible. You're probably the first one. Um, probably. Until very recently, I used to call him my chief resident. Um, he prefers Dr. Ibrahim now. Um, Andrew truly needs no introduction. Um, he has been one of my favorite people for a very long time, uh, super talented, a resident who's joining faculty here in Michigan. Um, he's also the chief medical officers for HOK. Uh, uh, How do you say it, HOK or HOK? HOK. HOK, which is a global design and architecture firm. He also directs the brand new health and design fellowship here at the University of Michigan, which is a combination of healthcare uh, or health services research in architecture with the goal of designing um, uh, uh, with always with health in mind. Um, he has been published in about every fancy um, journal and has done all the fancy things and was fancy before he met me, um, but that has never kept him from being an incredible advocate and a friend. Um, and we are very happy to keep him here in Michigan with us. Today, he's gonna be telling us, telling me, I'm like tuning in for this, how to write a paper in 10 steps uh, based on his now classic paper with Dr. Demick, who the league's uh, uh, fellows heard uh, from a couple of days ago, um, and about his uh, visual abstract and how to design your own. Andrew, thank you for joining us. Awesome. Thanks, Val. I really appreciate it. Let me see if I can share a screen here and see what happens. Let me go. Do you see my title slide? Great. All right. So we're going to tackle a couple of topics. We're going to try to think about how to write a research paper. Um, and also how to prepare a visual abstract. Uh, before I say that, I just want to say over the next few years, you should acknowledge that being a surgeon is awesome and being in the hospital is awesome, uh, but it's also very hard and that you should be kind to yourself. Everyone's going to tell you to read more. Everyone's going to tell you to study more, uh, but I will add one more to that and say just be kind to yourself more uh, and give yourself the time to go to live shows to go outside and hike, to start cycling or whatever. Um, it'll be necessary for you to set those patterns now um, and will make you ultimately more successful. Um, so we're gonna tackle these two documents that you guys got emailed. One is how to write a research paper and the other is how to create a visual abstract. Um, to me, there's a process of discovery in all this research work that all of you are already on and that's the exciting part. The next part is discipline, really kind of getting into a structure and a framework and training yourself to write in a way that's effective. Um, and then caring enough about your work to make sure it gets disseminated. So I'm sure all of you watched Hamilton at least multiple times and probably again um, at the beginning of July. And when Lynn Morrell Miranda was asked, you know, how did you become so capable of communicating complex ideas in prose that were so accessible to people. Um, he's basically said he sees it as a superpower and that he's very conscious of developing it. Now writing a research paper isn't like rhyming, but I think it is very powerful and that it's something that you can consciously develop um, that'll make you have a lot more impact. So let's get into the paper writing first. Research papers have an order. Um, typically, the abstract is at the front, then there's an introduction, there's methods, there's results, and a discussion. Each journal has kind of their own variation of that theme, but that's generally the order. And what you want to do most importantly is keep things in order, and the things that are supposed to be in the introduction stay there, things that are supposed to be in the results stay there, and that you don't jump around. Kind of similar to when you're presenting patients in the morning, and you're so excited you start giving lab values or vital signs uh, before telling us the subjective stuff. Um, try to stay in order and it'll make you disciplined, but let's break these down kind of one by one. 
So the abstract is up front and it is sort of the mini me of the research article. It has an introduction, a method, results discussion in a much shorter format. And I think most people kind of have their head around that. But what you may not appreciate is that an abstract actually carries multiple important functions. So when you're writing the paper, the abstract is actually very central to improving your research question. We often in our research group tell um, mentees early struggling with a question to actually just try to write the abstract first, even before we have data or before we have numbers, just to troubleshoot it and think, you know, if this is what the numbers were, would that even be a good question? Would that be an interesting article? Is that how we want to set it up? So its first life is that it really helps you figure out the question you want to ask. When you submit your article to journals and especially top tier journals, this is the first thing that gets read. And for many top tier journals, just the abstract alone is the grounds by which they make a decision to reject your article. So you want to spend a lot of time being really thoughtful to think, does the abstract really capture the essence of the article? Because that's the difference of whether or not you're going to get reviewed. Um, and then finally, after you get your paper published and it's out in circulation, and your goal really is to get people to read the article, well, this is their first glimpse of it. This is where they're going to get the trailer preview of what the article is about. And whether or not people are going to read the full article or not has a lot to do with how well you write your abstract. So it's not just kind of the summary that you put together at the end, but it actually has a really vital role throughout the entire process. Um, at Michigan, we are pretty prescriptive in our writing, and we follow a same pattern the same way every time. Um, it's outlined in that document, and I'll walk you through it here. The introduction always has three paragraphs, not two, not four, always three. The first paragraph should give the reader context about what's the topic you're talking about. You know, if we're writing about the Affordable Care Act or the Hospital Readmissions Reductions Program, people may not know the context or the history of that policy. So you got to bring them up to speed, let them know why this is an important topic. Next paragraph, you want to create some knowledge gaps. You want to tell the reader, okay, I've told you this topic's important, but let me tell you what's known and tell you what's unknown. And then finally, in your third paragraph, you're gonna lay out a roadmap for how you're gonna fill those knowledge gaps. Now, the classic mistake that I made multiple times, and I'm sure many of you will make early in your writing experience, is you often write about things that you care so much about and you know so much about, that when you write that second paragraph, you start identifying seven, 10, 12 knowledge gaps. And then when you go to the third paragraph, your plan is only to address two of them. Well, it's kind of a buzzkill for the reader because you just got them so worked up about 10 things. So make sure that the knowledge gaps you create in paragraph two directly line up with what you're able to answer in the paper. And if not, then leave it out. It may feel weird to you to be that concise, but that's actually one of the most important tricks to being a clear and effective writer um, is to sometimes write less. So after you write your introduction, you're next going to go on to the methods section. So when I was a med student, I did a research year at Johns Hopkins, and there was a famous person there named Dori Segev, who is a very well-respected, well-funded, and very productive researcher. And he frequently would say that you should read at least 50 papers, word for word, in your area and by your mentor to understand the language and convention to describe the work accurately. So I would encourage you that as you start writing the methods section, don't invent this on your own, don't make this up on your own. Read papers that use similar methods, similar data sets, and learn the language and conventions for how people are describing the work. Oftentimes at Michigan, the mentors you're working with will have done similar work in the past, and that can be a great source to um, start and learn how to write that section. Next is the results section. I don't know if they still use this book, but when I was a first year medical student, this was required reading. It was called Bates Guide to Physical Exam. 
And one of the things they really harped on in the physical exam is that you just describe what you see. You don't interpret it. You don't try to make assumptions about it. You don't try guessing about it. You just say what you see. And when I first had the results of the section described to me, it sounded exactly the same. So what you don't want to do, which is exactly what I did early on, is you don't want to, in your results section, say, much to our surprise, the results shockingly demonstrated no difference between groups A and B. That's already too subjective, and you're interpreting too much of the data. What you really want to do in this section is just very plainly and objectively say, there is no difference between outcome X between groups A and B, and then reference the numbers of the table. It almost should sound boring. The results section should be written so plainly that as you're like writing it, you're like, wow, I'm literally just transcribing facts. No interpretation, no sophistication, no nuance, just reporting facts. And then the discussion is where you really get to flourish and where you really start to bring all the work together. Now, up until this point, the introduction methods and results, you may have already written 1,500 words. That's a lot. And if you're a reader who's reading that, it's easy to lose track of what this whole paper was about. So in the first paragraph of the discussion, you sort of want to recap what the whole point of this paper was and summarize the key findings. You know, this was a paper to evaluate the Medicare Rural Flexibility Spending Program. Our paper had two principal findings. One, that they're more expensive, or two, that they, that they provide similar quality of care. Whatever it is, you want to be able to summarize your paper succinctly in this one nice paragraph. Now, let me give you a trick when you are further along in your careers and you start getting asked to review papers, sometimes you read the abstract and you don't have your head totally around the paper. Sometimes I skip right to the first paragraph of the discussion to look for another summary of what the authors are trying to communicate. It's kind of like a secret handshake that we put all the same types of information in the same location and you want to follow those conventions. So in that first paragraph, summarize the key findings of the paper. In the next couple paragraphs, this is when you want to demonstrate your thoughtfulness, that you know about the topic, and that you start placing your findings in the context of other people's work. It will often be the case that when you are citing papers in this section, the people who may be reviewing your articles may be the ones who wrote those papers. Um, and when editors are trying to find people to review a paper you submitted, they often look in this part of the manuscript to say, who else wrote papers on this topic and understands it and can speak to it? Um, so you want to be really sure that you're representing those other research papers correctly and that you've done your due diligence to read about what is there. Uh, this next paragraph, it's always the second to last paragraph. That's a limitations paragraph. And this is a super important paragraph that to my surprise, there are papers sometimes that get submitted where this is skipped entirely or it's done poorly. In this paragraph, you want to outline what are the things that are limiting in your paper, but also what you did to try to mitigate them. So if you said one of the limitations of this study is that we used administrative data that relies on claims. Well, someone could criticize you and say, well, that's not clinically accurate enough. But what you should do is in your next sentence say, however, in our methods, we use specific codes that speak to our specific outcomes to make them as clinically robust as possible to try to mitigate that. So in other words, for every limitation that you bring up in this paragraph, you want to follow the sentence right after it and say why it's not a big deal or say what you did to try to address it or to make it um, less of a limitation. Um, and then finally, this is sort of your call to arms. This is when you want to get people. So you've introduced the topic, you've told them why it's important, 
you've created these knowledge gaps, you've laid out some super compelling data and told people this is something new, but now you kind of are at the like, so what? Like, what do you want people to do now that they've read your paper? What you don't want to write is more research is needed on the topic because that'll make everybody pull their hair out. What you want to do is use this opportunity, you've gained some momentum, you have the reader's attention, state out some specific things that you want done. For example, you may say that in light of our findings, we think that policymakers should continue this policy. If it is continued, these three things should be considered or anticipated, or patients may benefit in the future from knowing about this, this, and this findings they could be communicated to patients or made more accessible in the following ways. You kind of want people who read this paragraph to at the end of it know exactly what they should do because they read your paper. So people often sell themselves short in this paragraph. And I think this is a really good time to bring out your activist side a little bit to say, here's why my work really matters. So now what? So now you've written a paper, it's compelling, you followed all the rules, you wrote everything in the right order, it's miraculously gotten accepted into a journal and publication. Now you want to think about like, how do I get people to read this? How do I disseminate and share this work in a way that gets people as excited about it as I am? So what I want to do for kind of this back half 15 minutes is tell you a little bit about the visual abstract and give you a little roadmap primer about its backstory. Um, and then also a little bit about how to do it. Um, and then we'll do some questions. So I'll tell you some of the backstory about how it came to be. I'll tell you some of the impact it's had and how widely it's been adopted. Um, I'll show you some templates and I'll just talk out loud through a visual abstract I created and kind of the thought process behind it. Um, and then I'll tell you about some of the adaptations and iterations and how it's sort of taken a life of its own. If you're not familiar with the visual abstract or haven't heard of it or seen it, uh, very simply, it's a visual representation of the findings typically found in the abstract portion of a research article. In other words, it's the visual summary of the paper. Um, rather than kind of tell you that, why don't I just show you a few? Uh, this is one from the New England Journal. Uh, that was a randomized trial for progressive glioblastoma using dual and monotherapy, and they found that median overall survival was no different. This was a survey in the Annals of Surgery that asked a thousand surgeons, what are your barriers to becoming surgical scientists? And the three most common reasons listed on the survey are there, pressures to be clinically productive, administrative duties, and concerns about work-life balance. Uh, this is a paper that actually wasn't a research paper at all, it was actually an opinion thought piece that compared what is it about the way we design airports that might teach us how to design hospitals better. And this laid out the key five points that were um, extrapolable in the design. Um, and then this is one from the CDC where they had had data showing that six out of 10 high middle schoolers and seven out of 10 high schoolers don't get enough sleep daily. So. In just about a minute there, I gave you the highlights of four different articles. By no means are you an expert in any of those four topics, and by no means did you read the whole article. But if you only had time to sit and read one of those articles, you are now in a much better position to know what it is that you want to go ahead and read. So I think of these visual abstracts almost like a movie trailer, and you're trying to find, promote your work to the right audience so that people who want to read your paper can easily find it. So how do you find visual abstracts? For the most part, um, there's about almost 100 academic journals who've adopted this, and they've primarily been sharing it on their social media pages. Uh, the New England Journal last year created their own searchable database of visual abstracts. That's basically like a visual abstract PubMed. Um, JAMA uh, has integrated it into the article itself so if you look at JAMA articles, if they have a visual abstract, there will be an icon there in the corner and it'll be listed under the tables and figures. So it's mainstream integrated uh, right into the work. 
So let me tell you the backstory about how this all even came to be or why um, it got invented. I used to live in London when I was studying um, architecture. And this is a very famous square in London. And typically the Americans, when you're crossing the street here, get made fun of by your British friends because on the crosswalk, it tells you to look both ways. And the reason is the traffic comes from the other side. And there are many Americans who often got blindsided by traffic looking the wrong way. And um, my British friends used to joke about it. And I used to say to them, you know, heaven forbid that if something were to happen, we're in London, one of the greatest capital cities in the world. There's many famous hospitals here. Um, surely I would be fine and get appropriate medical attention. And they all kind of um, looked at me oddly and I didn't understand why until many years later. So that was in 2010 when I lived in, uh, or 2006 rather, when I lived in London. And then fast forward to three years ago, um, I'm in my research time as a research resident I've taken over the social media account at the Annals of Surgery, and this paper gets published about the impact of creating an inclusive regional trauma system in London, who prior to this did not have a way to coordinate trauma across the city. And the paper was incredible. It essentially described that there were improved processes of care, increased ability to get to the right hospital, and increased and improved clinical outcomes. So I saw this and I thought, you know what? I have Annals of Surgery social media account. If I just share this on Twitter, it'll go viral. So I did, and I shared kind of the title and the text abstract, and it got seen 2,000 times. Eight people were so compelled by it that they went on to share it, and the article got read 81 times. And I remember feeling kind of bummed and thinking, man, if people just knew how important this work was, if I could just communicate that more quickly, I know a lot more people would want to read this. So that became the birth of the visual abstracts. This is the first visual abstract created um, now almost four years ago. Um, London trauma after establishing an inclusive coordinated trauma system. Access to a specialist on first arrival went from 16 to 84%. Involving of a senior clinician in the first 30 minutes went from 38 to 92%. And improved arrival for critically ill patients went from 69 to 89%. In just a few seconds, you got the main headline findings of that paper, and the impact was pretty In the first two weeks after sharing it as a visual abstract on social media, it got seen 35,000 times. Uh, 169 people went on to share it, and the article got read and downloaded almost three times as often. So the Annals of Surgery is one of the flagship journals in academic surgery, and we realized we had many stories to tell that I thought were important. So over the next year and a half, I created about 120 visual abstracts and disseminated them on social media. Now, because we're at Michigan and we're nerds and my mentor was Dr. Dimmick, it wasn't enough to just study something that we thought aesthetically was a good idea. Um, we wanted to rigorously study it using the tools of health services research. So we created a prospective randomized trial of 44 research articles. Half of them were shared as text alone. Half were shared as text and a visual abstract. We then waited a four week washout period and then shared the same article in the opposite format and then compared them head to head to find out, does it really actually matter if you share the article in a visual abstract format or a text alone format. And we measured that using impressions, retweets, and article visits. Not to get too meta on you, but this is a visual abstract summarizing the impact of visual abstracts to disseminate research articles. And essentially found that all the things that I showed you about that London article, we were able to reproduce consistently across multiple articles. And most importantly for me, as someone who spends a lot of time writing these articles, doing the work and the research, you want people to read your work. And so to see that articles with visual abstracts were read almost three times as often was really validating to me as someone who, someone who spends a lot of time doing the work um, and was a real justification for putting in the time to create a visual abstract. So, when we realized we'd come on to this, 
um, we decided to make it an entirely open source endeavor. Um, so we are now in our fourth edition of the Visual Abstract Primer that you got, uh, with a fifth edition coming hopefully in the next few months. Um, and that made it um, widely adoptable. So we're now almost up to 100 journals who have adopted Visual Abstract, including many journals that you see there and recognize, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, the BMJ, um, the CDC. And what's been particularly exciting and rewarding is that all of the um, templates that we created that you see there on the left side, um, journals are able to adopt them, make it their own, put their own style on it, um, and brand it with their own journal, but it still stayed true to the format um, that we had originally come up with. So I thought, you know, like how big can this really go? Like what is the scale of a visual abstract? So this was the first visual abstract the CDC created about whether or not kids get enough sleep. And within seven days, it got seen 1.4 million times. And the report had been downloaded over 13,000 times. Quite remarkable to realize that for information that's so important to public health, that creating this simple visual um, actually went a long way to disseminating important health information. Um, it went beyond kind of the United States. So on the left side there is um, a national health conference in Indonesia where they actually used visual abstracts as ways to create a competition to summarize which articles would be highlighted and featured throughout the meeting. And then the Cochrane Review, if I could think of a group that is pretty conservative in their recommendations and tries to stay by the book. I think Cochrane uh, collaboration falls under that. And so for them to disseminate and share the visual abstract as an important strategy for trainees uh, was quite remarkable and was part of this really turning the corner. Um, and then finally getting a little unsolicited celebrity shout out from Dr. Gawande certainly didn't hurt either. Um, so what's the secret sauce? How do you go from a text of two or 300 words that doesn't seem to get a lot of traction to a visual that you can digest in a few seconds and that brings a lot of attention to your work. So there are some real principles of effective design that anybody who's trained in architecture, urban planning, graphics, design um, will know these. Uh, and I think they're really important to embrace and bring them into your work in designing a visual abstract. So in the visual abstract primer, um, it outlines a lot of principles, but let me just highlight a couple for you and show you how they play out in actually doing it. When I start creating visual abstract, I spend a lot of time thinking about who's the audience? Who are the people that I want to read this? Is it scientists? Is it the public? Is it other clinicians and I try to sort of describe them very concretely. So when I think about academic surgeons, I think of them as visually oriented people by the nature of what we do. They're definitely very technical. They want specifics and they're busy. Surgeons are busy people who don't have a lot of discretionary time. So what does that mean? How do you translate those ideas into designing an effective visual abstract? When we started doing this, we actually started timing people to see how long does it take you to read a text abstract versus a visual abstract, knowing that our target audience are incredibly busy people. And we found that most people could read a text abstract in about 60 seconds, but a visual abstract could get succinctly read in about six seconds. Pretty remarkable, especially when you think about targeting a group of people that you know are quite busy. Um, this is one of my favorite roads to drive on. This is in Colorado, um, going from um, Golden, kind of up towards the mountains to ski. And what's beautiful about this road is when you drive on it, you know exactly where to go. You can't turn right, you can't turn left, you don't have to think about what speed you're going, you just go. It's clear, it's very clear, it's so clear, it's like fun to drive on. And that is how clear your writing in a visual abstract should be. It should be so clear that people have no question what it's about and have no um, question of what it means that they have to go back and reread and guess, super clear. So 
let me give you an example. When I first started to work on that visual abstract for London trauma, the top sentence is how one of my colleagues thought it should be summarized. Process measures and outcomes of care before and after implementation of a coordinated trauma system in London for patients experiencing trauma, specifically for patients with ISS scores greater than 25. Now that's true, but what a mouthful and not super clear. But what if you just said London trauma after establishing an inclusive coordinated trauma system? It's much more clear and concise about what you're talking about and makes it a lot easier for the reader to be guided where you want them to go next. So when I try to get to that succinct summary, um, I often start with a paragraph summary, which is really just the abstract. I try to narrow it down to just three bullets. What are the three key take home points of that paper? And I have a neighbor read those three points and said, if I just gave you these three points, would you know what this article is about? So once you have some of that content narrowed down, you can start putting the visual abstract into a visual format. So this is one common template or format that um, is used by a lot of journals, having kind of the key question addressed across the top, having the citation in the journal at the bottom, and then summarizing the outcome, stating the comparison, putting some visual display of the outcome, and then the data to support it. So let me walk you through just an example, thinking out loud of this um, visual abstract to show you sort of what that process looks like. Um, this is simply just creating three visual fields. It's not that fancy. It's just PowerPoint um, with three boxes. And I just copy and paste the title of the article and the information. And just like we did earlier, kind of driving on that road, could we make the title of that article more straightforward? Could we make it more clear and concise? So impact of treating iron deficiency anemia before major abdominal surgery. Then I read through the article and think, what are the key points or key outcomes that I want to communicate about this paper? Well, I wanna say something about blood transfusions. I wanna say something about length of stay. I wanna say something about the change in hemoglobin. So then I go through the article and I pull out those key findings. They're often in the abstract because the author wants you to emphasize those. Um, and, and then it's, easy, you might say blood transfusions 31 versus 12%. You kind of have an idea where it's going, but could you do something to make it even more clear, to make it even more obvious what you want the reader to know? So then I add some directionality to it. Decreased need for blood transfusions, 31 to 12%. Shorter length of hospital stay, 9.7 to 7. So what you can do with just changing a couple of words and keeping things pretty concise you can make it so much easier for the reader to get exactly the information that you want them to get. And then the visuals can be a challenge. It's a trouble and error, uh, trial and error, um, troubleshooting exercise. Those were the first ones I tried. I thought they looked weird. I then tried those and thought they looked better. Um, and then I adjusted kind of my um, centering and indentations for my OCD. Um, so the icons exist in all places. These are two of the most common places to find them is Google and something called the Noun Project. There is now more than a dozen or so icon banks on the internet, many of them which are free, for which you can find icons to help support your visual abstract. So that was like a quick 101 of sort of where it came from and how to create it. And what I wanna do in the last couple minutes is give you a broader view of a visual abstract to think about it not just in the setting of a research paper uh, but to think about it as a way to improve healthcare delivery in a much broader sense. So it has certainly gotten traction that it's being integrated formally into research curriculums. Um, the American College of Surgeons in their health services research course taught the visual abstract as a dissemination strategy for researchers at UNC, they teach it in their graduate epidemiology courses. At the Association for Academic Surgery, we taught it at the fall course. And at Brown School of Medicine, they actually have an entire art curriculum where one of the courses is actually taught in visual abstracts. Um, 
beyond just kind of the med school walls, visual abstracts are a really powerful way to communicate a talk that's been given. So Dr. Greenberg was the president of the AAS um, back in 2017 and gave this incredibly powerful address about um, women in surgery and a path forward for what the data was and a path forward for addressing disparity. The talk was incredibly well received. It was put on YouTube, a lot of people watched it. And then a surgeon uh, named Dr. Chelsea Harris created the visual abstract form of the lecture that she calls a live visual abstract that summarized the key points of the article. And you can watch on YouTube sort of the spike in hits after this visual abstract was created with a link to the YouTube video, and it almost got like a whole resurgence and another um, wave. So it's not really just about research articles, but also other work that we produce and that we think is important. Um, I think it has a powerful role in getting our work out to the public. So this was an article that Dr. Gawande wrote for Annals of Surgery about um, opioid stewardship, and he outlined these six strategies for um, what surgeons should do to play a role in uh, being good stewards of opioids. And you could see after Tulawande tweeted this out on his social media page, almost within days, um, the content showed up in mainstream outlets. Now, it's not that hard to imagine that if you wrote a 2,000 word essay in all text, in a dense journal, an academic journal, it may or may not get picked up by those in the lay press. But a visual abstract with clear, succinct visuals and summaries of the work certainly can attract a much broader audience to the work. Um, I love this. I love getting text messages from friends who like to say, you know, Andrew, I'm so glad there's a visual abstract for that paper because it was the easiest slide to make for my talk. And it's such an easy way that if you want people to reference your work, you're basically making the slide for them. You make it easy for them to uh, take a summary of your work and talk about your work um, with the least amount of effort. Um, and then this is one that caught me by surprise. Um, if I think of a topic um, that I don't maybe spend enough time thinking about or maybe search on collectively, it's maybe antibiotic stewardship. So I was kind of surprised when I saw this article in Annals of Surgery, but it was really thoughtfully written and laid out seven recommendations for surgeons to be better antibiotic stewards. And this in fact turned out to be one of the most shared visual abstracts in the history of the journal, in part because it had such a broad audience, but it also was action oriented. Um, one person told me that it was printed out and placed at the computer workstation where a lot of surgeons put in their orders. In a way of being real-time education as almost an intervention to try to improve antibiotic stewardship. So I'll leave you with a couple ideas about visual abstracts in your work. Um, for sure, it has a role in disseminating knowledge. Um, and I think that'll be important for you as you think about your work and wanting to make an impact on the world with your work. You want that work to disseminate. Um, it also helps you clarify your message. You know, when you're driving on that long road, figuring out like, what's the purpose? Like, what am I trying to say? What's the most succinct way to say it? It actually refines your message and makes your writing even better. And then finally, where I've been sort of spending a lot of time thinking is, could visual abstracts actually be a point of intervention? Could you actually develop educational information in a quick digestible visual format that can change people's behaviors uh, to produce better outcomes. Um, to be determined, but I know that there are people who are thinking about that and working on it. And then a final thought, um, I think there is a real advantage to um, young people coming to a new topic and often making it a lot better. So um, we are currently in the process of making the fifth edition of the Visual Abstract Primer. So if you delve into this work and start um, doing this and you find better ways to do it, you find a section that's not in the primer that you think would be really important, please reach out to me and let me know. We'd love to include it in the next iteration um, and make it totally open source uh, to make the quality of the work that comes out better. 
So with that, I'll say thank you and go blue. You guys have been very gracious with your time and I will be happy to take some questions. And I will say that my contact information is up there, both for things visual abstract, uh, but also if you just want to talk in general. So with that, I'll hand things back off to Val. Andrew, thank you so much. That was so awesome. I feel like I have been neglected all this time by not getting the full talk. Uh, and they wonder why my academic productivity is just starting. Um, guys, how about we open up the floor for some questions? I think the internet connection might just tolerate for us to go on video. So if anybody wants to go on video and ask some questions, um, we have about 12 minutes for questions. And we are still recording. So if there's any questions about anything else that you want to do off camera, just let me know and I will stop recording. Well, there's a question in the chat. Ooh, question oh. in the chat. I got it from Alyssa who wants to know what are your thoughts on incorporating aspects of the visual abstract into poster presentations? I love it. What a great idea. So there have been a couple um, big academic meetings, including Academy Health. Um, and the association, the Academic Surgical Congress, who, um, you know, we spend so much time on these posters and we often print them on this huge rolled up thing that we throw away after we come back. And so they experiment with the idea of what well, if you created a visual abstract for your research work and they just put it on a huge projector screen and that actually rotated throughout the meeting um, as a way to summarize your work or having entire poster sessions where everything was in a digital format and was essentially just the visual abstract. I think what's important about the visual abstract that is a little bit different than the way we normally think, it is not a standalone document or a standalone visual. It is meant to be an introduction or a summary. So I think for poster sessions, it'd actually be great because you want enough information to engage someone but then they're ultimately going to talk to you about your work. Um, so I think it would have great potential to be applied in poster sessions. Any other questions, guys? You can use the chat box or you can call on video. You're just so quiet. Um, I will have you, whoever has video, to come on video so we can take a quick screenshot for social media. Oh yeah, totally. We need like a good so that we can so that we can like, oh, shoot. I gotta add like, Justin Demick. I know. You know like, <laughs> my, like hair and like. I'm just trying to force them out. <laughs> Excellent. I have a twenty percent response. You guys probably don't hear it enough, but being a med student is hard and um, the work you're doing is awesome. And um, don't, um, don't be too hard on yourself. All righty. I wow, have. Wow, what a good I know. Okay, oh, I, I just people. need, I know, this is awesome. Noise? Oh, I will do, I will get, I will capture a screenshot from my end. I just need lighting. a couple. Okay. I know. We my great lighting. Have the best lighting for soon. Everyone lighting. fix their hair. Make sure there's no stuff in your teeth. I will give you a two second hitting, heads hitting. up. Your hair's fine. Don't have to fix it. <laughs> All righty. Uh, do I have anybody else? Okay, we'll do it this way. I will give you, okay, on three. One, two, three. Awesome looking. Okay, any more questions? Any other questions? We have about nine minutes of Dr. Ibrahim's time, which is precious. He only answers high power emails now, at least I for residents. For that. students. No, just kidding. <laughs> Guys, um, a thing that happens when you become faculty, which should be like one of the things that you look forward to in life. Is this and my I next step? This is my get, next best life. You sometimes get an administrative assistant who helps you handle your emails and schedule all your meetings. So it's almost impossible if you email me that I'll miss it because someone else also checks. So anyway, best life things to look forward to. Okay, we have another question. 
Uh, for from uh, G from for creating visual abstracts, do you think you have to do anything different process wise for qualitative, low sample, non interventional studies? Oh yeah, I love it. So we try, we did a couple qualitative pieces. There's a really good one, a really good paper about ways surgeons learn. That was a qualitative paper in Annals that we did a visual abstract for, and the way we ended up doing that. Um, is we took, when you write a qualitative paper, there's usually key themes that get pulled out. And so we made each of the themes one of the key findings. We didn't go very quote heavy to give quotations. We just said, when surgeons talk about learning, here are the five themes they talk about. And it was a short summary of the theme and a visual that went with it. Um, that actually um, was very effective in communicating that study. So we were a little intimidated by that. Uh, but actually worked out pretty well. One thing that was not in that visual abstract that I showed you that I think is important that we've changed since is we've added a little more detail around um, the type of study that it was and how many um, people or patients were involved to try to give a little more context and detail to the study. Um, so you'll see if you go on social media and use the hashtag visual abstract, you'll see a bunch of iterations of how people are doing it. And I'll kind of help you brainstorm different formats. Uh, I have a question. So one of the things that has been brought up with the visual abstract and like, you know, picking parts of your, uh, like your body work to put into this like, kind of like very well designed presentation is that maybe you're highlighting, like you're, you're pre uh, setting the reader to, like be looking at your data in a certain way before they have like the whole picture. Yeah. Um, so what do you think are some strategies to minimize kind of that like selection bias? Because if yeah. I have a study with multiple parts and I had like these three things that kind of like worked out very well, it would be my intention probably to highlight those if I only have three boxes versus being like, hey, I have this like 17 limitations to my study that I'm not going to put in my visual abstract. So in the, thanks Val, that's a great question. So in the longer version of this talk, um, there is a very humbling section called Visual Abstracts Gone Wrong. And it's basically all the errors I made. That's like, there's like a true learning curve to the whole thing. And one of them was exactly what Val said. There was this great randomized trial that showed leak rates with this different technique were lower. And I was like, so pumped. I like shared it. And then it got seen like 20,000 times within a day. And someone messaged me and said, you know, that's actually not the primary outcome of that trial or why it was designed. That was actually a secondary outcome. The primary outcome actually had like no difference. And it was like a null finding. And I felt so um, terrible that I clearly had just done exactly what you said. Like, you're excited, you want this to be seen. So you're like over prioritizing the like fifth thing on the paper that was an interesting finding, but you totally ignored the primary finding. So as a result of that and a couple other errors, we came up with formal guidelines for how to create a visual abstract um, that's in the primer and we ended up publishing it in one of the um, GI journals that's owned by Nature, but basically laid out like 10 criteria. And one of them was you have to report the primary outcome, whether or not it was negative, positive, neutral, you have to import that because that's what the study um, was designed for. So um, we learned the hard way from that, but that's a great question. There's definitely potential for bias in the work. Awesome, thank you, Andrew. We have one more question in the chat. Uh, actually, I think this might be- Oh, we did that one already. Same one, I think I already got it. Uh, any other questions, guys, before we let Dr. Ibrahim go? Well, one quick thing. <laughs> uh, Juan, what's up, bro? Hey, yeah, first of all, that, that was guys, really, Juan, really interesting. I tortured him for like a whole month. I don't know why he <laughs> talks to me, but I uh, it. it. This talk was really enjoyable. I, I was just curious, did, have you ever considered about putting like a QR code on a visual abstract or how do you, how do you, how do people find it since the title's different? Oh, that's just a good curious. idea. Um, we used to just post the article with a link to the journal article. 
That's a good idea. A QR code would be a great idea because then it sort of stands alone as a visual. You should innovate that and adopt it. <laughs> sure. Anyway, thank Might you. Might be helpful you, you for- You asked a thoughtful question and then you got signed up for work. That's how this works. <laughs> I was just thinking because you mentioned that one instance in which the like the most disseminated visual abstract got like pasted on like the computers of the workstations. Yeah. And so like if you didn't have exactly. the link available, like if you could just like pull out your phone and be like, why do they not want me to like like send this patient with bacitracin after their yeah. white local home? So that is inter an inter interesting idea. Wow. I've thought about it. So you know, my other background is like architecture, urban planning. <clears throat> I've thought about visual abstracts as like giant wall size murals on the sides of buildings like for wearing masks or whatever i was just gonna say oh like can we put them on the like, like <laughs> on things that we care about in a unbiased but thoughtful scientific way so anyway you guys are the dream makers no pressure but if you want to create a visual abstract 10 story mural you have my support you don't even have to credit me for the idea you can just run with it and I'll tweet it out. <laughs> um, all righty, we are out to the hour. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Andrew, uh, for taking some of your time and your like really good energy to share with Scrubs and Leeds. Yeah.